Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, June 9th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, our reporters are detained at Bilderberg, which according to some media outlets does not exist. Then, what's a realistic scenario for what would happen if food stamps stopped working? After that, guest star Obama says that politics is not a reality TV show. And the incredible response border residents gave to the prospect of the wall. That's next. This is pretty yeah. shocking stuff. So you send a liberal journalist down there, he comes back saying, Trump is right. That's right. They so we said, you got to go down there with no preconceived what? notions, right? Just an empty notebook, go to my former home state right. or my, you know, and, and, and walk the border, drive the border 800 miles and talk to whoever you see and, and let them tell us what they think about what's really going on and whether we need a wall, in fact, instead of hearing it from the debate stage. Well, the official beginning of the Bilderberg meeting has begun today and our InfoWars reporters are there on the ground. We're going to be playing some of their reports coming up later in the segment, but now Bilderberg has been exposed. It's been forced now into the international news. Our story was the top article there on the Drudge Report, uh, as well as we have many other mainstream media outlets having to cover this event. Now, a lot of them are kind of taking the talking points directly from the Bilderberg's own website, but at least we have finally got them to begin talking about this meeting of elites. Now, Coming up in the next few segments, we'll be checking in with our reporters who are there on the ground. And of course, you'll hear their story of how they've been detained. Imagine that they were in Germany, they demanded their papers, please. But we'll definitely be getting a lot more reports coming out of Germany. Now, this is a top story coming from Kit Daniels. He's reporting on the food stamp outage that could trigger nationwide riots. Apparently, thousands, if not millions of people who are on food stamps have, haven't gotten any of their benefits. It's nine days into the month now, and they say it's due to, quote, glitches in the electronic benefit transfer, transfer system. But many Americans are worried that if this outage continues, mass civil unrest will erupt. There is a website that reports on uh, these glitches, downdetector.com, and they are just all over the boards are lit up talking about, you know, this is gonna get really crazy. All you need is a little spark, and what's better to fuel rioting uh, than a lot of hungry people who are just trying to feed their families. So we've reported in 2013 about the administration and how they had a goal to dramatically increase food stamp enrollment in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And, you know, they've encouraged mass dependency on the welfare system. So they're basically ensured nationwide rioting at the flick of a switch when there is a large scale collapse on the food stamp program. because So many people are dependent on this. So this corresponds with a strategy called pressure from above and below, and it's when the government deliberately creates problems, and then they offer solutions that only expand government powers at the expense of individual rights. So this is incredibly frightening, and just more credence to the idea that you need to be taking care of yourselves, figuring out how to grow food for your own family, and don't put yourself at the mercy of a government who will decide that they wanna play with you and your family's life. Now. The feds can't even fund the welfare program that it sought to dramatically increase. Here's another fail. They can't pay for this disastrous Obamacare program. Now some uh, leading senators are seeking to stop the Obama administration uh, to they're wanting to provide some health insurers with a $2.5 billion taxpayer funded bailout. This is under a provision in the Affordable Care Act. So the senators are now petitioning their colleagues on key committees, and they're ensuring that we are not going to have to foot the bill for the excess costs that have been incurred by insurance companies who've been selling low-cost uh, coverage under the Obamacare program. We knew this was going to be a disaster. We knew the only people that were going to be signing up were people who were incredibly sick and needed this, but the young people who are having to foot the bill, the young, healthy people, just weren't going to sign up even with making it a federal mandate. So this is um, centers around a contested Obamacare provision known as risk corridors. And a lot of uh, Republican senators have been trying to fight against this risk corridor provision for the last two years. The federal government compensates insurance companies if they wind up with larger costs as a result of selling cheap insurance policies to unhealthy individuals under Obamacare. So they knew that was gonna happen, so they wrote the provision right in. And that's not it. You know, Obama, he just, I don't know, he's leaving legacies left and right. 
That's not all the U.S. taxpayers are funding. We're also funding Iran's military expansion. And that was thanks to the failed deal that was the Iran nuclear agreement. So this is $1.7 billion that the U.S. Treasury transferred to Iran's central bank in January. Uh, they, they transferred it during a prisoner swap and as well uh, the implementation of last year's nuclear deal. And they kept saying, you know, it was unclear what Iran's government's going to do with this money. But now we know the, that they have approved it. Iran's central bank has approved it to transfer to the military. So there you go. That's your taxpayer money. As Trump would say, it's a bad deal. Now, is it going to be any different under Hillary Clinton? I don't know. She's already admitted to faulty bookkeeping at her foundation. This was after a really hard-hitting interview by Anderson, CIA Cooper, who asked her, you know, about the fact that her foundation hasn't been wholly transparent, that they've obviously raised, raised huge sums of money uh, from foreign donors. And she said, you know, have there been some instances that slipped through the cracks? Yes, but overwhelmingly, uh, anything that, that they've disclosed, everything else. So he gave her basically several minutes to just brag about how great her foundation is and how nothing untoward has happened. So now the, the mainstream media can say, well, we talked about her foundation. We covered it with her. And Clinton herself said that no improprieties were found. Case closed. We don't need to talk about the Clinton. Now let's get back to the Trump University or whatever new scandal they can come up with. And now President Obama has finally come out and endorsed Hillary Clinton. But what did President Selfie Stick have to say about Donald Trump? I, I'm sure they're going to have a conversation. Is he ever going to drop out? I, <laughs> Or he's just going to stay in. I, I, and he's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking tomorrow. He's going to be coming to the White House. And I, I, the, the main role I'm going to be playing in this process is uh, to remind the American people that this is a serious job. I, you know, this is not reality TV. This is coming from the president who cannot wait to be an ESPN correspondent. He previously appeared on a slow jam skit with Fallon. He's been a guest on Jimmy Kimmel Live, The Late Show with David Letterman, The Daily Show, The Colbert Report. Uh, and last December, speaking about reality TV, he made headlines when he appeared on NBC's survival show, a reality TV show, Running Wild with Bear Grylls. Like, I can guarantee Obama has probably tried to push getting his own reality TV show, but... You know, he wants to call out Donald Trump. Now, despite the media witch hunt, uh, we're getting reports out of big data that Latino support for Trump is actually on the rise at 37 percent. And so you compare that with Latino support for Hillary Clinton, which is at 41 percent. It's very kind of neck and neck. And now MSNBC, uh, they had the editor in chief of Esquire magazine on the show um, and they were pretty shocked to find out that border residents wanted a wall. Now, this was uh, Esquire. They recently sent a liberal journalist to the U.S.-Mexico border to find out what people think about the proposed wall. And he said, you know, two things were said, whether they were Hispanic, Anglo, Democrat, Republican, uncommitted, clueless, whatever. They said, we want a wall, yet we want it married with compassion toward the people that we're trying to keep from jumping over the border. And so then the host said, well, this is just a complete shocker. Oh, my goodness. Most of those Hispanics are first generation and see it as unfair. They came over here the legal way. They became citizens. And now they're having to compete for jobs with those coming across the border on a daily basis. Have we not been saying this all along? So even with all of the race baiting by the mainstream media, by the presidential candidates themselves, you see that the people are intelligent enough to see through all of that and see what's really happening there, that they can still see the truth and that this is a big deal. Why is it racist now, though? Because you know what? Hillary Clinton actually called for border walls and deportation in 2006. Mexico is such an important uh, problem. Mexican government's policies are pushing migration north. There isn't any uh, sensible approach except to do what we need to do simultaneously, you know, secure our borders with technology, personnel, uh, physical barriers, if necessary, in some places. And we need to have tougher employer sanctions and we need to try to incentivize Mexico to do more. If they've committed transgressions of whatever kind, they should be obviously deported. Now, a lot of people were surprised to see Bernie Sanders meeting with President Obama, kind of making jokes like this will be the only time he gets to see inside of the Oval Office. But now here's Joe Biggs with some unconfirmed reports of just what happened in that meeting. 
Joe Biggs here with InfoWars.com. Now, we know that Bernie Sanders actually flew to D.C. and met with President Barack Obama. And now I have a source on the inside of Bernie Sanders' campaign who just sent me this message. It says it's confirmed that Bernie was offered VP from President Obama and turned it down because he wants Debbie Wasserman fired. Obama wouldn't do it, so Bernie is going to continue his campaign. He's very upset about the DNC turning on him, and that is basically the information we have right now. So that's pretty big, and if you don't know who Debbie Wasserman is, she is the basically the head of the DNC. So this is something that's happening now. We're going to keep an eye on it. Like I said, this is a source that I know that relayed this information to me. And as we get updates, we'll bring them to you. So stay tuned to InfoWars.com. Make sure you go to the Alex Jones channel on YouTube and our InfoWars social media accounts on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Social media posts generating controversy is nothing new, but the reasoning behind this one in particular is something unusual. Valedictorian, 4.5 GPA, full tuition paid for at UT, 13 cords and medals, nice legs, and oh, I'm undocumented. Now, if you're not aware, the University of Texas does have a program to where undocumented immigrants can come in and receive in-state tuition. By comparison, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. Had I come here right after high school, I would have had to pay out-of-state tuition. But I don't think that applies to this young lady as many people are insinuated. I think she got a scholarship to UT because she has a 4.5 GPA and also 13 cords and medals. I'm sure that debate will continue long past me, but I'd rather use this opportunity to talk about a different topic, and that is the political correctness when you reference people who come to this country undocumented, illegally, or whatever the politically correct term may be. And I hear this argument a lot that no person is illegal. And when I talk about illegal immigration, I'm not saying that a human being is illegal. I'm saying, did you enter the country legally? Example, I recently went outside the country, off the continent, as a matter of fact. And even though I had my documents, I had a passport, I had my visa, I had my bags checked by TSA or whatever their equivalent was, I got my pat-downs and all that. With all that said, had I walked out of that airport, skipped customs, and went out to the street, I would have committed a crime and entered that country, here comes that trigger word, illegally. Same thing if you did not go through the border checkpoint. Did you go through customs? Yes or no. Did you go through the border checkpoint? Yes or no. Now, notice when I said that it had nothing to do with race, religion, why you're there, how long you're staying, or anything like that. Did you go through the proper checkpoints? Yes or no. And I just think it's a good opportunity to bring that out. Uh, with this young lady's 4.5 GPA and 13 cords, I'm sure she'll be a great asset to the University of Texas. And regardless of whether she stays here, if she goes someplace else, I think she'd be an asset there as well. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. The perfect storm is brewing. Obama's last stand as the Solinskyite community organizer in chief has a finger on the trigger of mass unrest. When Obama took office in 2008, 28.2 million Americans were receiving welfare benefits. That number has grown to roughly 45 million under the only president in history to not see one year of 3% GDP growth. And there's millions of others that are on state, different food assistance programs. So it's, it's 101 million. 101 million get food aid from federal government, outnumber full-time private sector workers. And that's a Department of Agriculture estimate that CNS News reported on. How's that sound? Boy, that sounds like land of the free, home of the brave to me. And all these people are being taught, a guy driving a nice car, somebody that has a nice house, they're rich and they stole it from you. Earlier this year, it was widely reported that possibly up to a million of the country's poorest welfare recipients would lose their benefits under a welfare policy signed, sealed, and delivered by none other than Bill Clinton. The Fiscal Times reports, those affected are people aged 18 to 49 who aren't disabled or raising minor children. Most of them live a subsistence existence, scraping by with the help of government and charitable organizations and low-income jobs, although college students are also eligible. The landmark 1996 bipartisan welfare reform law crafted by a Republican Congress and signed by Democratic President Bill Clinton limited benefits for this group to just three months in any 36-month period unless they were employed or in a work training program. Of course, that was pre-Obama phone Obamacare. Here we are 20 years later and those chickens have come home to roost 
as the government has reportedly neglected to pay the EBT benefits for eight days. Michael Snyder of the Economic Blog reports, widespread reports continue to pour in from all over the nation of glitches with the food stamp system. It is eight days into the month and large numbers of people still have not received their benefits. And in other instances, it is being reported that EBT cards are simply not working correctly. Michael Snyder continues, on downdetector.com, there are scores of reports of problems with the EBT system from people all over the nation. Could this simply be another example of government incompetence or is something else at work here? Many things are at work here. The cultural poison George Soros has unleashed on America via Black Lives Matter and MoveOn.org, along with the recently legalized propaganda spewed out by globalist-owned mainstream media taking the side of anti-constitutionalists, fueling violent riots, the Obama administration, the Department of Justice, and the United Nations maneuvering of the Strong Cities Network, a real-time martial law initiative that needs a concrete reason to expand federal control over local police. Not to mention, roughly 11 million illegal immigrants were encouraged by the USDA to take advantage of the United States federal welfare system as the national debt approaches a hallmark of $20 trillion. Obama has overseen the exponential formation of a class of unemployed welfare recipients who expect to be taken care of, or else. It was reported during the Ferguson rioting that two new Black Panther members were planning a bombing of the famous St. Louis Gateway Arch and the murder of the prosecuting attorney in the Michael Brown case along with the Ferguson police chief. The plan fell apart after one of the accused bomber's girlfriend's EBT card ran out of money. This isn't all happening by accident or by powers beyond Obama's control. Mass food riots are par for the course as a last-ditch effort to install martial law and place the United States under New World Order domination. John Bound for Infowars.com we got three of our reporters there. All I can say is incredible job, crew. They are forcing the mainstream media to report on what's happening. Secret global government meetings, amazing. Uh, Paul, you're there at the train station. We saw a bunch of police raids, and we've seen women in hijabs walking around and kids uh, kids running around appearing to be on something, I, I'm not sure, uh, with another man that was drunk uh, talking on camera saying they were from North Africa and Afghanistan. Other points, and then I'd like to, you know, uh, basically get a ground tour for TV viewers, and I'll narrate for radio listeners. Yeah, one other point is that there were two arrests today. Um, there were two protesters who just turned up, calmly sat down outside the barricades. They weren't screaming, they weren't shouting, they weren't saying anything. They were holding two cardboard signs which said something like, why, why, the, trans why the secrecy, we want, tra we want transparency, something like that. Completely non-offensive, there were no cuss words in the signs. After about 30 minutes, the police came up to them and eventually it was three rows thick of police, obviously to keep us dangerous reporters away from them. They had a long conversation about how there was no free speech in Germany while Bilderberg is in the town of Dresden. And they were forced to put the signs away. And that's where it stopped um, in that moment. But a few hours later, uh, the police came back and arrested them for possessing a tent. They had this little green tent. I don't know what they were doing with it. But these people who were British, um, you know, they were quite polite people. They were just having a conversation with the police. But no free speech in Germany while Bilderberg is in town. And it's ironic because they were accosted by the police. And literally about five minutes later, um, Vernon Jordan arrived. I think that's his name. And he's a civil rights activist. So you've got a top civil rights activist heading into Bilderberg while within five minutes, people are being harassed simply for holding protest signs outside of Bilderberg and having their free speech crushed. So I, I thought that was kind of ironic. Well, I mean, look, I don't say this to be sensational. In fact, I'm almost ashamed that I'm not more upset. Germany has fallen to tyranny. Germany is like Nazi Germany again, but it's leftist control. They're arresting people for rallying. They're telling people, shut up. Uh, it's just, it's horrible that, that Germany has police that have turned into anti-free speech thugs and who follow illegal orders. This is, this is despicable. So that's all going on. But right now, let's go back to Dresden at the train station to see the results of the country flooded with the illegals. 
uh, there. And then uh, give us a tour. Uh, I'll narrate for radio listeners, Rob, dude. Yeah. Uh, well, Alex, right now, the guy that was jumping around earlier, he seems to have pissed off another uh, person who's over here. The fight might ensue in one second. Um, well, let's go over there. <laughs> All right. There's uh, a but drunk anyway, guy the hopping the around. He said he was from uh, Afghanistan. Or exactly. folks from Algeria. Now, I now, Alex, I ran around and shot a bunch of B-roll before we went on live. And uh, just walking around, just walking around here, um, I saw the cops questioning several groups of immigrants, just asking for their papers and whatnot. When we walked up, there was a guy showing them their ID. And, um, you know, and then going through the train station, some couldn't get on. One guy couldn't get on the train because he didn't have a ticket, um, but he was trying to get on the train. The guy said no. So he's sitting there talking to his friends. And, um, you know, right now it doesn't seem like it's super busy. But it's, uh, it seems to be, you know, packed with guys just hanging out, loafing around, as you could, uh, as you would say. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I talked to a family, a couple. I put the interview up on Infowars.com. This is a, she was German. He was Jewish. And uh, they seem kind of fine with the migrants coming in. They think they have everybody seems to think there's this endless pool of money to pay for benefits and housing and food. Even though for, uh, most of these radical Muslims being brought in on record want to kill every Jew they can get their hands on. That's true. And 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 we kind of got into that at the end. And uh, I said something in the, the terms of, you know, uh, maybe Germany has uh, Holocaust. Um, they feel bad for the Holocaust. So they're letting these people in to make up for it. And he didn't want to get into that. And that kind of pissed him off. And then they look, they, it's uh, globalism. They it's a project to end Europe. It's a project to create total division. They're bringing in people that just sit around are a bunch of bums and, uh, you know, adopt every form of crime you can imagine, because under Islam, it's OK to commit crimes right. against non-Muslims. Exactly. And, um, you know, another interesting uh, part, uh, thing that happened today, people, we can keep walking, people were um, coming up to us, wanting to know what was going on. All the tourists were, you know, the tours were going through and they would stop, they would hear us speaking English. What's, what's going on, what's going on? So then I just started videotaping these people and uh, saying, well, I'm gonna have to videotape you if uh, I'm gonna tell you what this is, you're gonna get educated. And so we just, you know, it started telling them about the Bilderberg group because there wasn't much going on for a few hours. We're sitting there waiting. I guess the highlight was uh, two highlights were Vernon Jordan and Henry Kissinger. I have yet to see Lindsey Graham show up. Well, let me ask you this of, question. Yeah. No. They just started arriving, you know, today and it runs the real Bilderberg's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday. Well, really on Monday so sometimes. The light. Why, Go ahead. Why? Uh, what triggered the police? Because I know this happened in Austria last year, too. Is it fair to say the worst police we've seen are in Germany and Austria? Because, I mean, we would report if somebody did something for the police to respond. But, but from what I heard from Paul, no one's doing anything. People are polite. They're, like, uh, threatening to arrest or arresting British uh, tourists. I mean, British tourists are stereotypically the nicest people on the planet. Yeah, and uh, and those people were. And they saw what happened last night. So they knew, what I think, what they were getting into when they w did their little protest. Uh, but basically, it just said, what have you, their sign said, what have you had to hide? And the other sign said, this will get confiscated prophetic because it did get confiscated and we've got that video coming out we shot it in many parts because it was kind of a long situation so there's photos up in the story on. at drudgereport.com the photos are there speaking of courage charlie skelton has a lot of courage because they target him i've got to say six seven i don't know time flies years that he's been covering bilderberg because he's with probably the biggest newspaper arguably in the world it's not even the new york times all over europe it's the big English, you know, uh, language paper folks read. Uh, and he's able to actually cover it. The Guardian lets him cover real issues because they know that's how you remain cr credible, in my view. Uh, and so so the police and governmental people know that he's, you know, high-powered. And, and I'm kind of speaking for him. I haven't had private conversations with him on this, so I've been at Bilderberg four, three or four times with him. He's a great guy, he and his wife. But... Am I correct in saying they target you, Charlie? I know you didn't come on about this today. You came on to tell us about what you've witnessed the last few days and as Bilderberg officially kicked off. It just seems like every year, and my crew was saying this, they seem to target you, detain you, arrest you, raid your hotel rooms, harass you, uh, try to get your rental cars taken away. I mean, is that an accurate statement? And why are they coming after you if it is an accurate statement? Well, uh, first of all, hello, Alex. It's lovely to be here. Good to have you. Uh, you're looking well, looking very smart. Um, uh, well, this year hasn't been as bad as last year, I have to say. Uh, last year was pretty bad. Uh, the Austrian police were, were pretty tough. Uh, but this year, the German police, you know, there's not much dialogue going on. And, and yes, I was, we, we were held up for, uh, you know, three quarters of an hour 
last night, you know, with the usual checks and, and this, that, and the other. And, and, uh, and I, I, to be honest, there have been other people this year who've had it worse. So, you know, which I have to say I'm glad about uh, on a purely selfish uh, basis. <laughs> Um, but uh, really, what uh, I think I have to say the story this year for me is the number of politicians that have come. It's a very, very political summit. And, uh, you know, people don't don't realize that it's you know, a lot of people. I don't know what they think it is. But when you look at the, the, the sheer number of politicians here, you have to treat it as a political summit. I mean, three members of the German cabinet here, you know, two prime ministers and, uh, you know, four finance ministers, including the Canadian finance minister. And there's a. It's a high-level political summit, but one that's thrown by, you know, Deutsche Bank and uh, Airbus. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lobbying junket, a big, intense one that that all of these people come to. Um, that that, um, yeah, that's that's as you say, it's a globalist operation. I mean, it very definitely is. Break down from your perspective how Bilderberg is changing because you talk about they're still powerful, but they're a little more paranoid. Well, one of the uh, I, I think with the Brexit, the whole the whole Brexit debate is 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 something that that concerns them because for various reasons it would um, it would completely unplug the whole TTIP trade deal. Um, and but worse than that, it, it would just it would fragment this uh, uh, the, this this building block of of uh, 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 the European Union, which is it's part of their. When I say they, I mean the kind of, uh, you know globalists. Um, uh, ideologues of that of that particular ilk, um, they it would it would be a a, 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 a dangerous fracture of of that um, of that kind of free trade and political bloc. And they talk about the serious consequences and the dangers. A lot of the people here have, in Dresden have spoken out. Uh, for example, uh, Henri de Castries, the chairman of Bilderberg. You know, he he talks about the serious consequences of Brexit. A lot of them do. Rob D reporting for Infowars.com. We're on the site of the Bilderberg 2016 protest and they, these young people over here with their cardboard signs and they're uh, being told to remove them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 police officers for two people with cardboard signs. 15 people to stop two cardboard signs. And I don't think we're hurting anyone. And like, uh, so I, I asked. Um, uh, and uh, you both with this um, transplant. Uh, it's not allowed. Well, here, if I here. start wearing it yeah. like this. Uh, no. Uh, there's an order. Is it today? Uh, Do you have it in English? Uh, it's in yes, German. Yeah. German. Uh, sorry. Yesterday, twelve um, o'clock mm. till Sunday, sixteen o'clock. Uh, it's forbidden. Mm. Um, so Finchstraße, yeah, the Finchstraße. But why? Like yeah? why? I mean, like, is, is the job of the police not to protect other members um, of the community? Like, uh, because I believe that we're not only just not hurting anyone else, I think the role that we're doing and expressing ourselves is absolutely essential in our society. The right to freedom of speech is, like, one of the most fundamental rights that we have. And it allows, you know, people to change the world for the better. And, and you know, if we can't have a right to freedom of speech, what really do we have? The government of Dresden um, decided. Uh, it's called Allgemeinverfügung. Allgemeinverfügung. Yeah. Who gave the government of Dresden the right to take people's rights away? It's not my decision. Uh, but you're enforcing it. That's right. Um, I've got no English. Do you know what? It would look a lot better for you guys if you just let us stand here. <laughs> 
Good father, um, man. The, the problem is there is an order of the government in yeah. Dresden, yeah. and <laughs> it's forbidden to build an assembly. Okay. You are an assembly. No, we're not. We assembly. think that you are an assembly. Sure. Wait for her. a little bit. And then ask to move back. Two meters, yep. Two meters. A little bit more. A little bit more. If we turn it upside down. Right here. Okay, is that good? We've now been asked to move back two meters from the incident. What's going on? We can't really hear. So the young man's trying to compromise. And uh, so he's arguing that he has the right to peacefully assemble and freedom of speech, and that he wants to know why the city of Dresden has taken that away. He's saying in. Telling them they can move across the area if they want to continue to protest. That's okay. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Police one for two cardboard signs. This is the uh, use of resources that's going on in Dresden to keep the Bilderbergers safe. I think it might be more, it might be 17 police for two cardboard signs. Right there. So we'll see how this is going to turn out. So they're taking their cardboard signs right now that said uh, this sign will be confiscated. So that was obviously uh, prophetic. And uh, the other sign talking about what's going on here with the Bilderberg meeting. Entschuldigung, Herr Till, ich durfte Ihnen eine Frage stellen. Ähm, ich wollte Sie gerne fragen, was Sie bei der Bilderberg-Gruppe machen. Danke. Was Sie, vielen Dank. Haben Sie, Danke, haben Sie dort eine Rede gehalten bei der Bilderberg-Gruppe? Ja. Treffen Sie sich mit Lobbyisten? Can you, give us the, can you give us the agenda, the real agenda? Frage. Was ist denn? Is it going to be bringing more migrants into Germany? Mr. Tillich, one question. One question, Sir, real quick. Why do you sell out our country to lobbyists that are paid without tax money? Why are you guys working for this? Why, who is he working for? Vielen Dank. Just one question. Uh, one question to the What mayor. are you going to be discussing at the Bilderberg meeting? Are you the mayor? So, one question, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Now they're running away. Look, they're fleeing. What do you have to hide since you're running away? What's the problem? Shit, that was... So who are we talking to just now? What was going on? Um, I don't have much clue about this guy. He is like the minister of another department of Germany, but his name is Tillich. And he's on the member list of the Bilderberg Group. Um, he's probably not a real visitor, but you know, he's the boss of this department here of Germany, of Dresden. So he maybe held a speech or something and he knows about it. So we tried to interview him and you know what you see, pure silence, saying nothing and being ashamed of it, like the normal result. Yeah, why didn't you want to talk? I mean, all you had was, a, uh, you were very yeah, polite. Just, I asked him one question, one question, but I don't know, he was just running out. So we wait for our friend Max, maybe he got another conversation. So yeah. That's that's how they behave when you ask them about this. Always the same. We've been through this a lot of times. Max, did you get anything? Yeah. 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 Oh, what did he say? Uh, well, he uh, I, I confronted him when he was going inside, and then he said nothing. Mike. Um, but actually, yeah. when uh, I, I asked him kindly if he would uh, answer me some questions about the Bilderberg because I was doing a whole report and stuff like that. Natürlich können Sie mir kurz sagen, was Sie sich bei der Bilderberg-Konferenz erhoffen? Ja, sehr. Sie können, Sie können mit reinkommen, mit dabei. Also, äh, mich würde interessieren, was Sie sich von dem Abendessen, an dem Sie ja teilnehmen, äh, was Sie sich da von erwarten, von den Gesprächen, die Sie da haben, weil die Leute ja auf der, ja, sag ich mal, weltelitären Stufe jetzt etwas höher stehen als Sie. 
Also ich glaube, dass es äh, da Bundesminister gibt. Äh, es gibt auch Unternehmer, die ich im bisherigen Leben schon öfters getroffen habe. Also das heißt, man trifft bekannte Gesichter wieder, aber man trifft auch neue Persönlichkeiten, die man bisher nicht getroffen hat. Und Bilderberg hat sich ganz bewusst für Dresden entschieden, um auch deutlich zu machen, dass das eine Stadt ist, die wirtschaftlich und wissenschaftlich erfolgreich ist und die gleichzeitig aber auch eine weltoffene Stadt ist. Und deswegen ist man hierher gegangen. Und ich hoffe mir, dass der eine oder andere, der jetzt hier ist, vielleicht sagt, okay, Dresden ist auch ein Standort. Ich habe es von anderen gehört, wo es wert ist, auch in der Zukunft wieder also quasi das auf dem Radar zu haben und zu investieren. Was erwarten Sie konkret inhaltlich von den Gesprächen? Können Sie dazu was sagen? Ja, ich bin ja, als, das ist eine Ausnahme, die man hier gemacht hat. Es wird von Fall zu Fall das gastgebende Land oder die gastgebende Stadt eingeladen. Das ist hier der Fall. Das heißt also, es wird mit, sicherlich, mit Sicherheit so sein, ich werde an einem Tisch vielleicht mit zehn Gesprächsteilnehmern sitzen und die restlichen 120 also quasi nur aus der Ferne sehen. Und wenn das Essen zu Ende ist, geht man wieder nach Hause. Also von daher ist die Erwartungshaltung, die, dass man vielleicht noch die Gelegenheit hat, in dem, mit dem einen oder anderen vorher oder nachher ins Gespräch zu kommen, auch für Sachsen noch mal zu werben, das ist das, was ich davon erwarte. Eine letzte Frage, wenn ich darf. Gibt es Sachen, die Sie an der Form der Konferenz, zum Beispiel die Transparenz wird viel kritisiert oder so, gibt es Sachen, die Sie an der Form der Konferenz kritisieren? Also ich habe ja festgestellt, dass im Unterschied zur Vergangenheit die Bilderberg-Konferenz nicht nur die Teilnehmer ja veröffentlicht hat, sondern auch die Themen, über die gesprochen wird. Und es ist, glaube ich, auch mal gut, dass man außerhalb der, der Öffentlichkeit und der öffentlichen Wahrnehmung im Prinzip eine Diskussion führt. Das findet ja auch an anderen Stellen statt. Also Unternehmen beraten ihre Unternehmensstrategie ja auch nicht öffentlich oder Politiker sind, wenn sie ein Gesetz erstmal erarbeiten, auch daran interessiert, dass sie erstmal in Ruhe auch das ausdiskutieren können. Und so müssen das auch solche Leute, die sich zusammentun und die über Angelegenheiten sprechen, die im Prinzip sie miteinander diskutieren wollen. Da werden ja keine Entscheidungen und keine Beschlüsse gefasst. Sie sind dem Aufsichtsrat verpflichtet, sie sind dem, äh, den, den Aktionären verpflichtet und die Politiker den Parlamenten verpflichtet. Okay. okay. Danke. So. And welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. Joining me now for the News Blitz is Darren McBreen. Now, McBreen, I've been in California. I saw the crazed look in everyone's eyes as they were worshiping Hillary Clinton, and it really frightened me for the future. I guess I failed to get the memo that it's time to start worshiping. It's the time to start work. Well, there's no doubt that Hillary Clinton is the ultimate candidate, the puppet candidate for the establishment. Oh, it's right? her time. It is her time, and, and she's funded by the globalists, she's funded by the big banks and the neocons, and even though I think she's probably the most unpopular candidate in America, or the one of the most unpopular and hated people in America right now, you'd never know it by watching mainstream media television, because they truly make her out to look like a hero and, and right. she looks like a, a legitimate presidential candidate. Right. I mean, how do you just gloss over the fact that she is under FBI investigation and that she's been continually been caught in lies over her email server, putting the country at risk and then lying again? And I mean, they they pretend that they are going to cover her Clinton Foundation, Anderson CIA Cooper. You know, he does the hard hitting piece and says, well, this and she's like, oh, well, you know, Was there some issues there with the accounting? Sure, but we did a really, you know, it's just like, come on. Well, look, we've told you many times on this program that there are only six corporations that own and control 90% of everything that you watch, that you read, and that you listen to on the radio. Only six corporations control all of it. And, and they've got their marching orders to support Hillary Clinton. Now, I want to show you something that we threw together. This is a compilation Uh, a, a news media compilation, and this is local news programs uh, all across the nation. It doesn't matter what city, state, or town that you live in. The news all across the board is all the same. Who are you really shopping for this holiday season? It's okay. You can admit it if you've bought an item or two or ten for yourself. Well, it's okay. You can admit it if you have bought an item or two or maybe ten for yourself. It's okay, you can admit it. You've bought an item or two or ten for yourself. It's okay, you can admit it if you bought an item or two or ten for yourself. It's okay, you can admit it if you bought an item or two or ten for yourself. It's okay, you can admit it if you bought an item or two or 
10 for yourself. Well, if you filled up your gas tank lately, then you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. So you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. So you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas Gas prices are back on the rise. Well, you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. Well, you don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. Well, you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are on the rise. I know. In consumer news, economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny step this year. Economic factors may take some spring out of the Easter Bunny's death this year. You came from someplace else. Somebody brought you. You came from someplace else. Somebody brought you. Shame on us if we forgot. Shame on us if we forgot. More tolerant and more just and more accepting. More tolerant, more just, more accepting. Do not threaten the burden of the house down. Don't threaten to burn the house down. They're not focused on you. They're not focused on you. And now let's look at the mainstream news media on a national level this time, repeating the same talking points, this time about Hillary Clinton, because regardless of your politics, Leanne, I think we could both agree that this is truly a historic time in our country. Did you hear it? It's the sound of that glass ceiling breaking, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on. It's an incredible and a historic moment, again, no matter your politics. And I think we can all admit, no matter what your politics are in this situation, no matter who you, you, you support, this is a very historic moment. Adam, no matter what your politics, this is a historic moment. Regardless of your politics, this is a historic moment. You know, with all the back and forth over Sanders and Clinton and Trump and everything on the Republican side, can we just take a second to stop and recognize history? Regardless of where you stand politically, tonight is a very special night for women in this country. And some residents this morning are saying that regardless of politics, they are proud that their local girl has made history. Whatever your politics are, we need to mark this moment in American history. Well, whatever, however you feel about Hillary Clinton, she certainly she she uh, claimed her place in history. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, there's no denying Hillary Clinton has made history. Whatever you think about Hillary Clinton, whatever you think about her politics, an important moment for the And look, these talking points are not only repeated on television, but you can see the same talking points on websites and in newspapers. Check out the LA Times article. This is just from yesterday. Hillary Clinton finally breaking the glass ceiling. I wonder where they got that idea. Did you hear it? It's the sound of that glass ceiling breaking, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on. Darren, you know, I kind of just get the feeling that regardless of what our politics are, we really should just stop and acknowledge that this is a really important it's, time. It really is an important time. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, her story. Yeah, it's her story. It's time to just go ahead and get rid of that. Well, all across the board, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's newspapers, television, even movies, uh, uh, television shows, Madam Secretary, which is based on the real life of Hillary Clinton. Uh, yeah, supposedly. <laughs> yeah, it's all priming us to accept this time as if we didn't already know that she was going to break through the glass ceiling. And you know what's crazy is there's a lot of people who they don't necessarily read news websites. They don't watch television news, but they, they'll watch television and they still yeah. get these strong political opinions by watching shows like Madam Secretary, or House they will see Hillary Clinton on Saturday Night Live, think she's very funny, and that's how they elect yeah. their president, because she's a woman. Right, or President Obama on Jimmy Fallon, or any other myriad of uh, television appearances he has made. So, yeah, Donald Trump's bad because yeah. he used to be a TV reality a show. Very person. successful TV reality <laughs> uh, producer. Well, Darren, let's not forget that just last year we reported on the Obama administration meeting with producers in Hollywood and having them inject 
political agendas in their scripts, in movies, Sony in television pictures, shows. Sony Pictures and Disney, that's what they, they, he met with the CEOs of, of Sony and Disney to help control the narrative. Exactly. On, on Muslim immigrants and also ISIS. Yeah, and that's it. And that's how people, they can just watch a show and have a fully politically informed opinion without even being involved in politics at all. But they don't even know where they're getting these ideas from. And, and don't forget, folks, that the CIA infiltrated the news media long ago. This is just Google search Operation Mockingbird, right? And and so this goes all the way back to the, to the inception of the CIA. So this started right. in the early 1950s, late 1940s. Right, as well as they also infiltrated all the civil rights movements. And when you see this woman who is so proud of Hillary Clinton making history and as a democratic socialist and just can't wait till this is going to be ruling the country and how she's been a political activist all these years in a, in a, in a political movement that was infiltrated by the CIA, which used those movements as social engineering tools. Yeah. And she's just so proud of the fact that now they're so completely successful. So wow. we're Hillary, glad everybody out there has got their eyes open. I was going to say Hillary Clinton came here to delete emails and destroy our country. And she's all out of emails. <laughs> well, thank you, Darren. And thank you guys for tuning in.